Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Kurokade, consultant rhinologist and anteriorscular surgeon from Winchester and uh, University Hospital, Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of organizing team to the second day of inaugural winter global rhinology and skull base surgery webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We had hugely informative and engaging 15 sessions on endoscopic sinus surgery presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons on day one. We'll be having similar sessions today focused on anterior skull base surgery. This event is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Grohlmann in Utrecht, the Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stoss. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. We're now going to move on to our next uh, presentation from uh, Professor Narayanan, who's the uh, Senior Professor in Otolaryngology at uh, the University of Malaysia. He's got a major interest in anterior and uh, lateral skull base. Uh, he's a past president of the Malaysian uh, ENT um, Society and very active uh, academically. So we're, uh, we're, we're waiting with bated breath uh, for your uh, presentation. Look forward to, uh, to listening to you. Thank you, Sean. Can you just let me in then? I'm not able to share my screen. Good morning, guys. It's uh, late in the evening here, but uh, good morning to everyone. If you allow me to share my screen. Yep, I'm in. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to speak on is uh, on endoscopic management of bleeding. So, so let's start off with some uh, let's start off with some anatomy. So this is an orbital dissection, as you can see, and that shows very nicely the anatomy of both the anterior model artery, how it enters between the superior oblique and the middle rectus, as well as the that's the anterior model artery that's going into that's coming in between the superior oblique and the middle rectus, and that's the optic nerve going into the cavernous sinus and the carotid artery. This is a dissection of the infratemporal fossa, 
it shows the left side of the infratemporal fossa. It's an injected specimen. We have opened up, that is the infraorbital nerve, as you can see. That's the maxillary artery with a descending palatine before it becomes a sphenopalatine, and then it goes on into to become the, uh, the sphenopalatine artery. So this is a dissection of the uh, skull base and the pituitary gland itself. So what makes this dissection a bit more unique is that this is a, a very nicely injected cadaver. So that is the right paraclival. This is the left paraclival with a carotid siphon. And then if we visualize, you can see the optic nerve on the right and the left and the optic chiasma. And you can actually make out the superior hypofacial artery here. These are the superficial, superior hypofacial artery coming from the left. And then you can also make out the inferior hypofacial artery and how they both anastomose together. So this, this is a very nice view. Again, you can see the inferior hypofacial artery on both sides, both the right and the left, and how they anastomose together to form. So with this, this gives us a rough outline, an anatomical outline of all the blood vessels that are involved during uh, sinusal surgery. And obviously, there are medical conditions that we have to assure it is sorted out. In my part of the world, traditional medications are very common. So it's very important for us to tell them to reduce the traditional medicine or stop it completely. Smoking... In my personal experience, I find that smokers tend to ooze uh, quite a bit. So sometimes for major surgery, you do want to tell patients to stop smoking, at least for one to two weeks before surgery. So this is what I do in, 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 in my setup. Obviously, it's a head-up position. Immediately after intubation, we spray the patient with co-phenylacaine decongestant nasal spray. And then we do a blind packing of a uh, ribbon gauze with adrenaline, one in a thousand. This is completely blind before we, we scrub. Then we go and scrub. So that gives us around 10 minutes of uh, the spray and the pack inside. And then we pack directly into the sphenoid model recess, if it's the skull base or the middle meters as required. Obviously, there are other methods as well. Um, some people use stiva, hypotension, local injection, palatine blocks, preoperative steroids, sunsetting acid. So you do whatever that you feel comfortable, whatever that works in your hand. So there are a few methods that you can actually use uh, to stop bleeding or to reduce the amount of bleeding that you have. Sometimes if you know that you're going to have a difficult case, you can actually do a sphenopalatine artery, a cautery, or you can actually do a maxillary artery cautery if you're doing an angiofibroma and you do not want to embolize for any obvious reason. So let's start with a simple sphenopalatine artery cautery. Yeah? So this is a dissection that I did in Chiang Mai University. The easiest way is obviously to make an incision just a few millimeters uh, in front of the attachment of the uh, posterior end of the middle turbinate. And then once you are inside the periosteum itself, it's very important to enter the periosteum itself. And if you lift it up, there's no other structure there and you'll be able to visualize the artery very nicely. This is an unedited video and you can see that the duration of the it takes or the time taken to do the sphenopalatine artery is less than two minutes if you follow this method as well. This is a real life case of a patient with a sphenopalatine artery that required the sphenopalatine artery cautery. And once we have the same method, a few millimeters in front of the attachment, posterior attachment of the middle turbinate, uh, go right to the peri, uh, periosteum, lift it up. But what is important is we need to make sure we skeletonize the artery 270 degrees. In this way, only then are we able to identify the entire artery and then we can cauterize the artery and you can see very nicely how the entire sphenopalatine artery has been cauterized as well. Maxillary artery clipping. So I, I tend to do a maxillary artery clipping before angiofibromas for small, small tumors, simply because we lost, we had a, a patient who had a loss of vision because of embolization. So for small, small angiofibromas, I just open up the posterior wall of the maxilla, identify the maxillary artery, and then clip the maxillary artery just proximal to the descending palatine artery, as you can see. You want to preserve the blood supply to the palate, so we clip the artery at the descending palatine artery. So with this is the view. So this is what I would do as long as I'm able to access the maxillary artery. I will not embolize. I'll just clip the maxillary artery and continue with the dissection. Simply because we had one patient who lost his vision on one eye doing embolization because of an abnormal vessel. This is another example of a maxillary artery clipping. This patient had the radio NPC completed radiotherapy, had a nasopharyngectomy, the tumor recurred. I've dissected the tumor away from the, uh, from the tumor and you can see the, maxillary, the tumor that's adherent to maxillary artery. So what we need to do is first of all, to clip the maxillary artery. And I always use two clips simply because just in case the first one slips, the second one is for luck as a backup. 
And it's very important when we clip, we clip all the way to and to. So we need to make sure that the posterior end of the clip causes the posterior end of the vessel as well. And once we have done that, then we can lift up and cut it. And when we cut, always make sure there's a small sliver of vessel so that the, 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 the uh, clip does not come out. This is an example of a patient who had uh, extensive CA palate, who had quite substantial bleeding. Again, preoperatively, we open up uh, doing surgery before we excise the palate. We uh, open up the left maxilla, identify the maxillary artery, and then we are able to clip the maxillary artery quite nicely. Always, again, two clips, and make sure the clip goes all the way to the end. Always inspect and make sure the clips go all the way to the end, and then we are able to continue with the surgery. Here you can see very nicely the clip, because we are, we are doing the surgery on the descending uh, part of the palate, so we need to make sure that the descending, descending palatine artery is clipped, and you can see the proximal artery, maxillary part of the artery is pulsating, while the distal is not. So this is a patient who's got a uh, extensive adenocystic carcinoma of the infratemporal fossa. So that's quite significant oozing. So what we're going to do is, uh, after we've exposed the infratemporal fossa, we're going to open up the posterior part of the maxilla and then uh, identify the maxillary artery. The best way to tease the maxillary artery is by using a sickle knife. It's sharp enough to be able to dissect very nicely, but it's not sharp enough for you to cut through and through. And then again, as I mentioned before, two clips Make sure the clip crosses all the way uh, to the back, and then we are able to continue with the dissection and remove the tumor from the infratemporal fossa and the maxillary artery and the pterygoid muscles as well quite nicely. So these are the ways that we can reduce bleeding even before surgery, uh, even, before, even before the actual surgery itself. What do we do when we have an unexpected uh, uh, bleeding? So this is something that we all encounter once in a while. And the more advanced cases you do, the more difficult cases you do, this is something that you will definitely have. So although it's easier said than done, if you are the surgeon, the most important step is not to panic, simply because you are the captain of the ship. And if you panic, the entire operation theater is going to panic with you. So no matter how panicky you may be inside, it's not humanly possible not to panic at all. You can always pack the area calm yourself and get help. And no matter how experienced you are, it's always good to get someone to divert the blood away with a good suction. Once the blood is being diverted away by an assistant who's holding a good suction, you're able to locate the bleeder. And then there are only a few scenarios that can happen. And this is uh, the way I, I describe it. The first of all is a shooter. This is probably the best kind of bleeding you can get unless it's an ICA. Because a shooter will show you the exact location and you'll be able to cauterize it on the spot. The most difficult bleeder will be the mucosal tumor bleed and the oozing because it just continues to pack continuously and you will not even be aware the amount of blood that you have lost. And if you have bleeding from the bone, all we need to do is use a bone wax. And if you have a sinus, like an intercavernous sinus, sinus and skull base, we can use a bipolar. So this is an example of a shooter. As I, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, I do not embolize uh, my angiofibromas unless they are significant. So this is a maxillary artery that is shooting. So this is one of the best vessels to, one of the best shooters to cauterize simply because you know the exact location and you can cauterize it very nicely. And, you, and if you see, you will see I'm using a regular head and neck bipolar. This is another example of a shooter. This is coming from the either sphenopalatine or the posterior nasal branch. And very easily, you can identify the shooter and then cauterize it either with a monopolar or a, uh, uh, or a bipolar. This can be easily sorted out as well. This is an interesting case. I was doing an optic nerve decompression and I saw the op just the orbit that is decompressed. And that's the optic nerve that has been decompressed. And you can see a vessel that is running inferior to the, to the optic nerve. So if we pack this, we are going to uh, compromise on the optic nerve itself. So how do we cauterize a vessel that is running on a bare optic nerve? The best way is to lift up the blood vessel away from the optic nerve. And this can be done by pulling it. And then by using a cautery, only cauterize the vessel itself without touching the optic nerve. There you go. With that way, the bleeding stops very nicely as well. So this is another example. Here you can see we're doing, I'm doing another optic nerve decompression. And this is a very, very nice case because the bleeding is not coming from the nerve or from the orbit. It's coming from the edge of the bone here, as you can see. So how do we stop this bleeding? Obviously, one, we can just pack that area, but that will also compromise the optic nerve. So the easiest way, as the dictum, as I said before, 
whenever you're bleeding from the bone, we use a bone wax. So we need to localize, place the amount, right amount of bone wax exactly on the edge of the bleeder. Make sure if too much of bone wax, that's going to compress the optic nerve as well. So once we've placed the bone wax, we're going to use a suction, remove whatever excess, and only the required amount is being compressed onto the bone. Therefore, the bleeding stops very nicely as well, as you can see here. This is, another, this is another example of a case where it's a patient has got a scalbis papilloma. This patient had surgery before, uh, two, three years before. So the optic nerve and the carotid artery are all decent. So the first thing we do is to remove, by using a debrider to remove all the, uh, uh, all the papillomas until we are able to go into the dura. By using a divider as well, you can actually remove the tumor from the dura. And the divider is great in that sense because you, the rounded end will push the dura away and then you're able to remove uh, the papillomas from the dura very nicely. You will have oozing. There is no way you can stop the oozing and the only way you can do is to remove as much tumor as fast as possible. Uh, that's the only way the oozing will stop. And finally, we're able to identify the location of the oozer or the origin of the blood vessel. That's the carotid artery that is decent from the previous surgery. That's the optic nerve that is decent from the previous surgery. So to cauterize this, what we need to do by, by, is by using a suction, tease away all the blood supply and all the attachment into one single point. Tease them away. That is the back carotid artery, as you can see. And then we can cauterize after we've lifted up and this is the final view of the surgery. You can see how uh, there's the dura, there's the optic nerve that is decent on the right, and as well as the carotid artery decent, there's the optic nerve decent, and there's the carotid artery that is decent on this side as well. So this is another example of, uh, of, of surgery when we have a significant bleeding from the seminal palatine artery. Yeah? So um, I'm not going to talk about um, carotid arteries because I think Rick Rao is going to be speaking on um, carotid artery. So this is probably the best shooter you can have. It tells you exactly where the location of the bleeder is. You can use a uh, um, bipolar cautery and you can cauterize it very nicely as well. Another example of a shooter. Um, again, these are from different, different surgeries. You can identify the exact location of a shooter. And then with this, by using a simple bipolar cautery, you can stop the bleeding as well. Uh, so this is um, another tumor case where I'm doing an esophagectomy. And again, you can see a uh, shooter that is quite obvious. So again, these are the first, the, the most common kind of bleeders that you'll find. And as you end up doing bigger, bigger cases, then you'll be able to tackle mucosal bleed and the tumor bleeds as such. Let's go on to skull base now. So patient's got a meningioma. Uh, this is a pre-op view. This is an old video, but it's a, it's a very nice video that shows a quite significant amount of bleeding. This is an intercavernous sinus sinus that is bleeding, as you can see. So I try to cauterize it. And sometimes intercavernous sinus sinus, the more you try to cauterize, the more it bleeds. The more you suck on it, the more you touch on it, the more it's bleeding. The bleeding has not stopped. It's just going into the suction, it's going into the, uh, going into the suction. So we've just converted a small, tiny oozer into a shooter, now into a significant bleed. And the way to stop this bleeding is just by using a surgery cell, place a surgery cell on top of it, place a patty on top of it, and wait for two minutes. It's very difficult to make surgeons like us who are so impatient to wait for two minutes, but that's the only way it's going to stop. This is another example of an intercavernous sinus sinus bleed. Always uh, divert all the blood into the suction, so that you can recognize the exact location of a bleeder, put a surgery cell on top of that area. This is an unedited video. Put a patty on top and wait for a while and you'll find the bleeding stops and you're able to continue with the surgery. So this is a patient who's got a meningioma. And when you have a meningioma, sometimes you have very abnormal uh, skull base like this. Look at the plenum. The plenum is filled with abnormal thick bone. So what we need to do is to drill. When we drill this bone, we usually get significant amounts of bleeding. You can see the amount of bleeding that you get from here. This is quite common simply because you are, you're actually taking away the blood supply. So the neurosurgical part will be very easy. But how do we stop this bleeding? The best way is to take bone wax, apply them uh, liberally over the, the, the area of the bone. And then to make sure there's no more bleeding, you drill on the bone wax itself. So what it does is it pushes all the small, small bone waxes into the crevices and therefore you do not have any more bleeding and you're able to complete the surgery and drill it and expose it very nicely as well. Another example of an, a cavernous sinus bleed. In this case, you can see the bleeding is coming from a cavernous sinus. We're able to localize the bleeder because it's surrounded by bone and we're able to stop it by bone wax and continue with the surgery.
Uh, this is another example of a skull base. Uh, skull base. Uh, we are opening up the dewa, and we had significant bleeding from the intercavernous sinus sinus, as you can see. Yeah? So we are cauterizing, and that's the kind of bleeder that you will get. So sometimes the intercavernous sinus sinus bleed can be quite significant. It's co it, you, you will be able to control it eventually, but it can cause quite a lot of bleeding. And for those who are just starting off in skull base, the amount of bleeding that you get can be quite scary as well. So don't panic. This bleeding, we can stop. It's not an ICA bleed. You just have to, uh, after a while, you learn to admire the way the blood, blood uh, uh, pulls up. Just suction, identify the exact location of the bleeder, and then you can easily put flow seal into that area if required. And by putting a patty, the bleeding stops very nicely as well. This is another example of an intercavernous sinus bleed. We are doing a uh, optic glioma that requires a transclival uh, transplanter. And this is the amount of bleeding that you will get in, in sometimes my intercavernous sinus, sinus bleed. Again, what we need to do is uh, do not panic. Identify the exact location of the bleeder by uh, using by uh, using a suction, divert the blood away, and sometimes by using a bipolar, we were able to be able to stop the bleeder. In this case, we were not able to stop the bleeder with a bipolar. Therefore, finally, we ended up using a flow seal uh, to stop the bleeding. So, but in for us, flow seal is not covered by the hospital. The patients pay for their own flow seal, and uh, one and, and one flow seal is uh, is very significant. So, we only use the flow seal only if uh, the bipolar doesn't work or or cotway doesn't work. We don't have the luxury, like most of you guys, to be able to use flow whenever you require. Let me show you some cases now. This is, this is a patient who had multiple open surgeries for angiofibroma. And here you can see a craniotomy scar. He's got a, a cut here that shows he had a lateral rhinotomy as well as a carotid artery ligation. And if you look at the scan, you will find that a significant tumor, angiofibroma, into destroying the pterygoid plates, going into the floor of the skull base, going into the cavernous sinus, and into the middle cranial fossa as well. So the problem with this patient, he's bleeding every week, literally having profuse epistaxis every week. The problem is the previous surgeons have tied off the carotid artery. Therefore, now the patient is getting blood supply from the internal carotid artery and the vertebral artery as well. So whatever you do, you never, never ligate the external carotid artery for an angiofibroma. Even if you clip it temporarily, you always remove it so that otherwise you will get uh, the current tumor will take the blood supply from the ICA or the vertebral and we will not be able to embolize it. And in this case, the patient had a vertebral carotid collateral. And although my, my radiologists, uh, who are very efficient, they used an ultrasound, identified the stump, the, the other stump of the external carotid, and tried to embolize it, even then, there's significant amount of blood supply from the ICA which could not be embolized. So even before surgery itself, we knew we we're gonna go for a blood bath. There is no landmark whatsoever, four to five different surgeries, all open surgeries. And you can see the tumor, the maxilla is completely filled with tumor. You can see it's like a balloon and that's the mesh that was used to, orbit, to identify to repair the orbit. So what I did was I used the lateral wall of the maxilla as my landmark, dissected the tumor all the way in and then went into the infratemporal fossa. And you can see the kind of bleeding that you will get once you are in the, inside the infratemporal fossa. Remember, this patient has got a significant ICA blood supply, and we, which we were not able to embolize. And you can see, and this is not a venous bleed. This is a significant, carotid, significant bleed from the artery itself. So what I did was I packed the infratemporal fossa, identified the tumor, as you can see here, um, and then um, that used a cautery to use to stop whatever tumor bleeding that I can. Then I just debride the entire angiofibroma simply because the tumor was so hard, so fibrous that the simple dissection will not do. So at the end of the surgery, then I use a dilute hydrogen peroxide into the infratemporal fossa region. And then this is the infratemporal fossa itself, the tumor removed. And I use the fibula to pack this area and the bleeding has stopped and the patient is quite well. I'm sure the tumor will recur eventually, but there'll be a battle for some other day. This is another patient who presented with severe headache. And if you look at the scans, you can find that that's the carotid artery. That's the horizontal part of the carotid artery. This is the carotid artery on both sides. The entire sphenoid sinus, the petrous apex, the temporal bone on both sides are completely filled with tumor. So whenever you see a view like this, where the floor of the sphenoid sinus is completely dehiscent, 
is literally sagging down like this, beware. It means that the entire tumor is eroded, the temporal bone on both sides, the pituitous apex, and only the septal flaps are actually holding it up on both sides. And the minute we open up the flap on both sides, you, we, all we had was oozing tumor, liquid tumor, liquid tumor, soft tumor, and then we saw structures like this white structures like this. And we were thinking maybe we should take a biopsy because we couldn't really make out any landmark. That's the optic nerve. And after we packed the area for a bit longer, we were able to identify more structures. And we found that is the carotid artery. The, this is the, the dewar. That is the carotid artery that's completely dehiscent. The tumor has eaten up the entire skull base, the pituitous apex on both sides, and the dewa is exposed, and that's the carotid artery. Thank God we didn't take a biopsy. You can imagine what would have happened. In the same way, you can see the paraclival carotid on this side. The problem with this case is very simple. There's so much of oozing that you go on stopping the bleed by doing suction. It's a very nice view of the paraclival carotid there. We actually lost five liters in blood in less than 30 minutes. So beware of oozers like this. You lose a lot of blood and you're not even aware. So you should tell your anesthetist to tell you every time you lose 500 ml of blood, one liter of blood, 1.5 liter of blood. Otherwise, before you know it, you'd have lost the whole body volume. We were able to stop the bleeding by using a fibula. And this is how she looked like three weeks after the surgery. I, I apologize about the quality of the, uh, of the video. And this came back as a neuro end to excess. Another example of a patient is a patient who's got a tumor in the cavernous sinus. She came with a six nerve palsy. And you can see that that's, that is the just proximal to the cavernous sinus, extending all the way to the cavernous sinus on one side next to the artery here. So what we did was um, we opened up, that is the carotid artery on this side, paraclival carotid. So we, the bone over the cavernous sinus was extremely thin. So we open up the bone over the carotid artery by using a carousel punch. And with this, we were able to expose the tumor completely over the cavernous sinus. Now comes the most difficult part or the most crucial part. Now we will have to open up the cavernous sinus itself. So we were hoping that the tumor has compressed the cavernous sinus and thrombosed the cavernous sinus adequately so that we will not have any more bleeding. Um, so we were quite hopeful towards the first part when we open up the first layer of the dura. Looks like there is uh, maybe the cavernous sinus and you can see the tumor already. Maybe now we've actually entered the folds of the cavernous sinus and visualizing the tumor. No bleeding so far, good news, and then it started. So the cavernous sinus was not thrombosed and we had quite significant bleeding from the cavernous sinus itself, which required to be controlled because before we can actually continue with the surgery. So this is the bleeding from the cavernous sinus, sinus again, cavernous sinus itself. Do not, do not panic. We identified, uh, we used surgery cell, we put it into the cavernous sinus, and then we were able, you can see, despite the surgery cell, the amount of bleeding you have, it took us almost 30 minutes just to control the bleeder itself. So this whole video has been com compressed just to show the amount of bleeding you can get and how we finally stopped the bleeding by using a flow seal in the cavernous sinus, and then we were able to resect the tumor. So here now, once we have stopped the majority of the bleed in the cavernous sinus, we are now going to dissect the tumor out of the cavernous sinus. So that's a tumor that's being taken off in the cavernous sinus. And you will find that once we take out the tumor, there is bleeding again. There's bleeding when you open up the dura of the cavernous sinus. And there's also bleeding when you remove the tumor completely from the cavernous sinus, simply because the, the tumor was compressing the posterior part of the cavernous sinus. There's a tumor that's being removed. And now we are inside the cavernous sinus proper, dissecting Ricky, my neurosurgeon, and, and is dissecting the tumor out of the cavernous sinus. And uh, that's the upper part of the tumor attachment to cavernous sinus. And with that, the tumor was completely removed from the cavernous sinus itself. That's coming out from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And now that's the final view. We just stopped the entire bleeding by using some surgery cell, as you can see. And can you imagine the biopsy came back as an hemangioma? Bad enough to have a hemangioma to have it in a cavernous sinus. That's a nice experience in how you manage bleeding. So let me go on to intracranial bleeds now. This is a patient with a revision meningioma. This patient had uh, an open surgery before, uh, uh, at, sorry, at the endoscopic surgery before, which was not successful. So now we are doing the tumor dissection. As you can see, um, we are able to identify the tumor brain interface. We are dissecting the tumor from the tumor brain interface, as you can see quite nicely. The tumor is coming out very nicely. The problem with a recurrent uh, 
um, revision surgery, there's always addition. And you can see there's a bleeding at the back intracranially as well, right? So we're going to remove the tumor completely. And then we have to deal with the intracranial bleeder. So that's the intracranial shooter, as you can see. Yeah? That's the intracranial shooter that now we're intracranial. So the problem with intracranial shooters is you cannot uh, pack this area like how we do in, this, in, in, in the thyroid nasal cavity. So what we need to do is we need to identify the exact blood bleeding, bleeding area and then cauterize it if we can. And if we cannot, I, I did manage to stop the bleeding with the surgery cell and we finally stopped it by using a flow cell. Again, as I said before, we only use flow seal as a last resort because patients have to pay for their, the flow seal itself. And with this, we were able to complete the surgery. This is another very interesting case. A patient who had bleeding um, during surgery, this patient had open surgery before. And this is the kind of bleed that we had from one of the branches of the ACA from the, from the, from the, uh, uh, from the meningioma. So we did identify of all this, the bipolar didn't work at that time. At that particular crucial moment of time, the bipolar didn't work. I don't know whether you all have had this before, but it can be extremely frustrating. So it took us almost half an hour to stop this bleeding. And it's very important to tell the anesthetist that you have a significant bleed. You can't just pack that area because you are inside intracranial cavity. Uh, and finally, we did stop the bleeding by using a flow seal and surgery cell and we managed to stop the bleeding after almost 20 minutes of struggling. But let me tell you, just 20 minutes of trying to stop this bleeding, it's like a, a stress test for the surgeons. We probably lost one year of our life as well. So this is the, what you want in normal, usual skull-based surgery. This is one of the post-op of our meningiomas, the septal flap we use before we reconstruct. And that is the, now we are looking intracranially. You can see the ACAs, the intercavernal, the, the ACAs, the intercommunicating, the optic nerve, the optic nerve that's compressed, chiasma, the optic nerve that is compressed on the left side, pituitary stock. And if you go slightly lower down, you can see the basilar artery as well. So this is the view that we all, and that's the third cranial nerve here. This is the view that we all want to see. But trust me, life is not always like this. And more often than not, you will have significant bleeding. And I hope uh, I've shown you most of the bleeding and I hope you find this use useful. The most important slide, I believe. I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you very much for having me. Stealth Station ENT, the advanced image guidance system for the full range of navigated ENT procedures. Engineered with you in mind, based on decades of scientific, clinical, and engineering expertise. We're expanding what was previously possible with image-guided surgery. Flexible and elegantly designed, Stealth Station ENT streamlines the workflow so you can maintain focus. The flat, under-the-head emitter allows for an efficient setup. Its design allows for a large EM field. Easily find your patient's exam through a variety of network options, super speed USB or optical disc. The visualization and modeling features give you the perspective you need. Leverage data from multiple sources to create high resolution 3D images. View structures and pathology with high fidelity. Registration expertly matches the three-dimensional positioning of the patient with the preoperative images used for navigation. Patient registration combines registration methods and provides numerical and visual accuracy feedback. Leverage the latest technology for advanced surgeries. See more. Do more. The result? You have an image-guided perspective like never before. With Stealth Station ENT, you're at the forefront of ENT surgery. You are Stealth. Thanks, Greg. That was, um, that was a really uh, fantastic talk. Really, really enjoyed Thank that. You. Um, uh, you showed some really superb clinical cases there and, and uh, just sort of, I suppose, highlighting what a really interesting group of patients you, uh, you have coming through your practice.
Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. You, you described it as a, um, a, a, I'll quote you, a, a stress test uh, for <laughs> surgeons. I, th I think this morning this has been a stress test for the, uh, pan the remainder of the panellists and the, uh, the attendees as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a couple of questions um, that I was going to ask you. One um, comes from the, uh, the audience, and that was, uh, what's your approach of a tumour in cases the carotid artery? So, well, it depends a lot, a lot on, the, on, on the time of tumour you're dealing with. So quite often, you do not need to take out, dissect the entire tumour from the carotid artery. Now that you have gamma knife, so you actually can remove tumour, whatever that is possible, and leave tumour that is stuck to the carotid artery and use gamma knife if required. Sometimes I think that in our pursuit to have beautiful videos, we tend to overdo surgery. You will get it away. You will get away for the first few times, but all it takes is one bleed, one mortality, one death, that will, people will only remember the problems you've had. You can do a hundred thousand beautiful cases. One mortality is what people remember. So if you ask me, I would think that if you have a tumor uh, around the carotid artery, and if you try to dissect it and you find it's absolutely stuck, leave it alone. Give gamma knife, and that usually works quite well. And, and would you agree that this sort of surgery is not, not for the occasional individual it's not for dabbling in these are the sort of cases that really should be concentrated in uh, in centers that are doing a lot of cases like this and people should think about referring very challenging cases they don't have much experience in absolutely true that's why i said we can do a hundred thousand beautiful cases all the people will only remember the problems that you had so as you see the way i presented i started from the simple the very simple ones and so slowly progressed uh, towards the end i've got actually i'm only showing like less than 10 percent of my videos the amount of bleeding videos i've collected over the last 15 years is 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 a lot simply because we do a lot of the raffle cases but as i said before it's not uh, it's not for the faint-hearted and don't panic it's impossible not to but don't panic yeah. You panic, game over. And, and, and I suppose just lastly, for the, for, again, for, for the attendees, and in terms of you, you were almost presenting a sort of a ladder of, of, of hemostatic options um, from the, the, the very straightforward through to the more complex and, and really thinking about the appropriate option in the appropriate place because, you know, using diathermy too close to vital structures is, is, is clearly something you'd want to avoid if you can, if you can avoid it. Uh, what about using hot water? Do you have any experience of that? You know, one of the, we do. A, a, a setting where perhaps you don't have the, the finances that uh, uh, others do. We do. Is, th that's a good question. We always irrigate with warm saline. The temperature is usually around 40 degrees Celsius. We always have a continuous, uh, on, a, on a 20 ml switch with a J sucker, there's always a continuous irrigation that's going on at the same time. So all the bleedings that I showed you are actually bleedings despite the warm irrigation. So because uh, the cost is a factor for us, I work in a, in, in a government university and flow seal is, is, not, is not available all the time. So what I showed was a, a sequence of step-by-step step how we only use flow seal only when it's absolutely necessary. Lovely. Uh, that's, that was fantastic. A real tour de force. Thank you. I very enjo but, uh, enjoyed that. And uh, having said all that, I'll now hand back to uh, Ashok. Thanks very much, Ashok.